one brunette. Like, snap. Flatten the backs on the Persian rug that came with my flats. The hair swells into a yin-yang. I place my hand on the Guinness black down of hair back. Traps between two dimples like parentheses. I kiss two mouths to taste compete a garlic tang of hair and hair sour milk. And I am the hair, as she is to me. Put things that don't matter in parentheses. She is drunk as a yo yo. And she asks us to stop. So she throws a strop, and even though she knows it can validate my tendency agreement, if she smokes and does, she sparks up a tab and blows. She knows we are trapped between her slow O's. The sound puffs of her parentheses. And she is conspicuous, largely by her absence, the one for which I have no lavish metaphor. And I am to her. She is to me. She put things that don't matter in parentheses. Put things that don't matter in parentheses. So I come from a place called Millsborough, which um, is an industrial town that built steel and um, it's a bit of a boom bust town and now there's not, nothing to do here. There's, um, there's a large kind of inconsistency between the, the rich and the poor. And some of the people who've done well for themselves have done so because they were offshore and made a little bit of money for themselves. So these people kind of um, have a mortgage, have a new build, 2.4 children, they spend two weeks offshore, two weeks onshore, and they don't seem to like to um, hang around with each other when they come back on shore. They have a lot of parties, a lot of cocaine parties, a lot of drugs at these things. The kind of parties that I don't get invited to, nevertheless I do. And this is about the behavior that I've observed there. Middlesbrough sweats out into the North Sea, third generation boom and bust bastards who were born, so it seems, to wear industrial hard hats and fluorescent flat jackets, industrial hard hats with ear defenders. They only hitch up to catch the kind of cat call calls and jokes. I'd make a complaint to Emily in equality and diversity too. Only I don't. And all he worries about is how much disposable income he can <laughs> snap up his snot box before getting an earache off his missus. And all I worry about is how much I can skim off his coffee table top before pissing off him. And it's 3 a.m. And his eyes resemble windows lag icons as he confides all she ever was was a desperately needed hole that desperately needed fucking. And her eyes are doing the moon roll scroll of a screensaver once. Same as his. Same as mine, and above this conservatory's double glazed dome, the moon is doing the same. The cursor scrolled across the screen, save the sky. I'm going to keep up with the theme of the moon and do a poem about the moon. On my seventh birthday, my grandfather snuck the moon in his palm, plucked it from the September sky and tossing it to my fumbling hands. So there was nothing a persistence of vision couldn't achieve. I flood the catch, scrabbled, sprawled on all fours on the linoleum floor where it spun like a top and gazed up at the vastness of space where no moon now hung. Only my grandfather. And the weightlessness of his advice, which wasn't finally figured, an Easter egg. The hidden explanation to the trick, only back then framed by the kitchen door, backyard invisible, invisible, beyond sky tarp, all in black. I believe in what my grandfather had appeared to do, so when he stooped down low to scoop the spinning moon back up and with graceful flick, <gasps> flip it back big. I believe that too. Of course it was a trick. The judicious application of a phenomenon animated is called persistence of vision. If he'd really struck the moon from the sky, we could have expected a tsunami a thousand, thousand feet high to come tumbling down those terrace streets. A creep as each to the dense circumference of that moonlight coin. That didn't happen. At seven years of age, nothing on this earth had prepared me to be skeptical about a man I looked up to. And at 39, little's changed. Um, don't know if I've got time for this. Five, six, uh, right, I've got, um, oh, thanks. 
I've got um, an Alabus bust, bust that I bear an uncanny resemblance to. If you uh, don't believe me, I shall prove it by finding a picture of it. Let me have a look. Where have you gone, Alabaster Bust? There you go. I think you'll, you'll admit that there's a... There's a resemblance there, or there was. Um, I've got um, a long poem about the Alabaster Bust, which has become kind of like a, a signature poem of mine, which I don't have time for. But I did take the bus down to London to perform at the Poetry Cafe once. And I took the bus in like a little kind of caddy. And I went around the London Museum with the bust. Um, worried that uh, people were going to think on the way out that I'd nicked one of the Elgin marbles or something, but that didn't happen. Anyway, this is a poem about what happened afterwards, and I'm going to leave you on this one. After visiting the British Museum, I meet a man in a London pub who tells me alabaster absorbs fingerprints. That's why curators wear white cotton gloves. Think of all the times I've handled you glovelessly. My harsh marks, your headaches. Could a forensic archeologist split open your head and identify me? Or was it simply a figure of speech I simply took at face value? Still, I'm sorry for touching you. The sebaceous cysts that crawl the not had migraines that pull like a tenuous metaphor as I try to get my head around it, the sense we made. Still, I'm just as clueless as you. Thanks, I've been Francis Golm. You've been patient. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, and uh, that's the taste of uh, tea side poetry from Francis Gomb today. And uh, Pirmal sahib, the for the flute, Pirmal. <laughs>